The Bible reading is taken from Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Hannah. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for a new year. We thank you for the new wine of your kingdom. And Lord, we pray that as we hear from your word today, maybe something new would strike us. Maybe something would be renewed or restored within us as we celebrate our worship and as we celebrate at the table of our Lord in a few moments. Lord, we commit ourselves to you now. We open ourselves to hear from you. And Lord, would your words be on our hearts and on our lips this day and every day. Amen. Amen. Hands up if you love to be criticised. All right. Okay, I didn't expect to see any hands go up for that one. Who likes uh, for people to question their decisions or question why they do something or question their reasoning? Okay. Now, we know that Jesus, throughout his earthly ministry, heard this question all the time. Why? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why uh, do you associate with people like that? Why do you sit down and eat with tax collectors? Why do you claim to be the son of God? Why, why, why? And Jesus himself is maybe the, the best kind of example of how to respond to criticism because he does it in such a, a gentle way, but he really strikes at the heart of an issue. So the next time somebody criticizes your driving, I encourage you to think, what would Jesus say in this situation? Um, Often Jesus is sought after, and he's sought after by uh, the scribes, by the Pharisees, by the Herodians, the Romans, even members of his own family. And here in this instance, as Hannah read so beautifully for us, he's being questioned by the followers of John. John the Baptist, John his cousin, those who followed John's teaching. Okay, we know a good bit about John, and, and uh, Simon spoke a little bit about John, about John uh, before Christmas. And we talked about John being very often called John the Pointer, you know, because he's always depicted in pictures and paintings and sculptures as pointing towards something. What's he pointing towards? He's pointing towards this new kingdom that is coming, this one who is coming after him, who brings... The, the, the brings in the, the glory of the kingdom. He brings in the mission and the message of Jesus Christ. He points in the direction of Jesus. But in his life and in his ministry, um, he's very strict. He's very self-denying. He shuns any kind of self-indulgence. We kind of have our picture, uh, a picture in our mind of John the Baptist as being kind of this wild man, you know, that lives out in the, in the desert. He's hairy, you know, he eats, uh, you know, wild, uh, wild honey. He's dressed in uh, animal skins, okay. But he follows a, a very strict, self-denying um, discipleship course, let's just say it like that. He, he follows this in a way that emulates and uh, points towards something that's greater and better and something that is to come. So the followers of John who come and question Jesus in this passage in Matthew are going to be quite like 
John, they follow in his teaching and in his way as they seek to serve God. Uh, so they would have looked at Jesus and how his disciples and he behaved, and they would have seen people who had sort of no self-control, okay, because they, uh, they don't live a similar lifestyle. They're sitting down and they're eating with uh, sinners and they're eating um, on the, on the, or they're drinking on the, on the Sabbath and they're doing all sorts and they don't fast, okay, they don't fast. If you were having a party, okay, if you were having a great big celebration, the disciples of John would probably not be the first people on your invite list, okay, but they, in how they uh, live and seek and serve God, what they do is very different from what they witness Jesus and the disciples do. And they say, why do you fa not fast while we fast, while everyone else that we know fasts? Why don't you behave like we do? And Jesus, as we said, is this uh, example of how to respond to your critics' response and says, well, you're right, you're correct. We don't fast. The disciples don't fast, but there's a reason why. And he says this, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Okay, can we uh, not celebrate when the bridegroom has arrived for his wedding party? Okay, so for those who have recently had a wedding or are planning a wedding, uh, the, the thing in Jewish culture at the time was that the wedding was the celebration of a lifetime. Okay, now, my wedding was wonderful, wasn't it, darling? He's not even looking at me. Um, our wedding was wonderful. It was the best day, okay? But in Jewish, Jewish culture, a wedding lasted for a whole week, okay? Sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds rather expensive. But a celebration of a wedding, of a marriage, lasted for seven whole days. And it was so important and it was so vital to the, the, the um, life of the, the culture and the society at that time that the rabbis had made an official ruling that during a wedding celebration, you don't have to fast, you don't have to observe all the religious uh, observances that would have lessened the joy of the bridegroom. They were supposed to be having a whale of a time at the expense of the family and celebrating with the bridegroom while he was there at the celebration. This was the event of a lifetime. And Jesus' response tells us that what he's saying to them is, look at me here with you now. The celebration of a lifetime is here. The event of a lifetime is with you. And just as two people who uh, uh, get married, a man and a woman who get married, they pause, they stop work, they run around like headless chickens for a week to make sure that they have everything prepared for the big day. We stop, we pause, we celebrate. Jesus is saying, that's what we do when we follow Jesus, when you follow after me. He's saying, what you have to understand is that following Jesus is a life of continual joy. It's not just one day or one week. It is a life of celebration. We're called to feast and to celebrate with the bridegroom. We've had plenty of feasting and celebration over the last month or so, haven't we, with Christmas and New Year. But in this new year, we're called to feast and to drink. And maybe that's very appropriate as we come to our table uh, in a little while. The challenge is this new year to feast and to prepare. Feast and prepare for the new wine that will to come. We're to feast on the word of God. Uh, two of our uh, prophets that we read very often, we have Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And Jeremiah, um, he says this in chapter 15, when your words came, Lord, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. And then Ezekiel has this encounter with God, and, and God says to him, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. Say, I've opened my mouth. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. He said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I may give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. 
I wonder, now I, I remember these, I'm hoping somebody else does remember these. Does anybody remember the edible paper you used to be able to get? The, the bank notes, okay? The little bank notes and you were eating like a 500 like pound note, which of course is not exi non-existent. And then, or if you've got, if you ever make these Betty Crocker buns that have a nice wee paper wafer on the top, I think these are football teams, I'm not really sure. I think they are, um, but I thought, you know, they'll enjoy this one. So you, you remember you, you kind of take it and you think, are you sure, are, are you sure I can eat this? You're saying, Nana, are you sure I can eat this paper? The thing about the Word of God is that it is edible, okay? So I'm not suggesting you go home and start tearing up your NIV, but what I'm saying is that we can take it, feast on it, eat it, fill our stomachs with it. It's there as our daily bread. We come to our table of, of the Lord and we celebrate the spiritual food of Christ. It is the bread of heaven. It's the bread, the, the feeding of God, the word of God. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount says, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We pray, give us our daily bread. That's daily feasting, daily eating, taking in the words of God. We hear the words of Jesus who says, take, eat, this is my body that's given for you, do this in remembrance of me. This new year we have to fill ourselves, fill ourselves with the word of God. When all is good and all seems calm and we think everything's right in the world, we're feeding ourselves with the word of God. When things really don't seem to be going our way, we fill ourselves with the Word of God. When we're hungry, when we're in need, we fill ourselves with the Word of God. We talk about in, our, in the life of our church family here about going deeper and wider. If we're seeking to go deeper and wider, if we're seeking after renewal and restoration, if we're seeking after the new, the new of our Heavenly Father, we need to be taking in that food that he's given us, the food that is placed before us. And in feasting on his word and in sharing in his joy and celebrating the Saviour and all that he's done for us, we take it in. And then we enjoy the new that comes and filling ourselves, the new wine will flow. You know, in, in 2 Corinthians it says, uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Jesus wasn't saying, you know, um, Jesus was saying, sorry, Jesus was saying that the new kingdom has arrived. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Something new, there is new wine. We're being remade and renewed and recreated. That is the new wine of the new kingdom. And Jesus uses these two metaphors uh, that would have been familiar to the followers of John and to anyone else who was with Jesus and listening to him. He compares a joyful life of following Jesus to patching up old clothes and to storing new wine. You know, you don't, if you're going to mend your trousers, okay, you make sure you wash your little bit of cloth that you're going to uh, stick on first, okay? You're not going to put an unshrunk piece of cloth under no piece of clothing because it's just going to break away. And neither do you when you've got new wine flowing or you've made new wine. You, you uh, don't put it in the old wine skins because the old wine skins become dried up. They're not as flexible and new wine needs that flexible skin to breathe and ferment and grow and mature. We can't wrap up the new in the old. We allow the old and what's gone before to uh, help us mature into the new that is to come. Jesus was bringing in the kingdom, the new as the fulfillment of the old. So this year will bring new things and new challenges, new opportunities, new relationships, new chances to go deeper and wider with God. And we've got to prepare for that new wine. Jesus is saying to the disciples or the followers of John, what you're saying is something new. What you're saying is new wine. We need the flexibility to accept and see it grow and mature 
and to see it really um, come to all that it could be. The new wine of the kingdom doesn't fit into the dried up old pieces of uh, wine skin and a patch, a new patch doesn't really fit in with an old patch of clothing. It's a new way. Jesus is ushering in a new way and a new way that requires a new way of doing things sometimes and a new way of being. Jesus came to introduce the new, not to patch up the old. He doesn't come to destroy the old, but he fulfills it. In our day and age, you know, so quickly habits become traditions and traditions become pillars of faith and pillars in our lives that come become very hard to break down. What habits, habits or patterns of thinking from 2023 do you have in your life that need to be broken down? Okay, because they're not going to be able to contain the new that God is going to do in your life in 2024. We can't wrap up all the new with the old baggage of the past with old habits or the things that would hold us back from uh, uh, following Jesus more nearly. And we all have those habits and habitations, hesitations, habits and hesitations. We all do. We're all human. But in 2024, we can choose to live out the new year in a new way with Jesus. Um, So we allow the new to come within our lives. You know, it says in in Matthew again, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. A new year is a fresh start. It's a new year, a new opportunity for fresh hunger, for fresh thirst for more of Jesus. So we feast on his word. We take it in every day we read it we um, have our you know our little calendars with a verse for the day we have our daily bread we listen to ucb other christian radio stations are available but we fill our lives with the word of god and we prepare for the new things that jesus is going to bring into being and we open ourselves up and we allow ourselves to be flexible and allow ourselves to be ready for what he will do When we follow Jesus, we must be prepared for a new way and a new way to look at people, to uh, approach life and a new way to approach this year and how we live out every day, perhaps. So maybe it's time for new wine uh, and we need new wine skins. Maybe it's time for new thirst uh, for the things of God, new hunger for the first of God or maybe the things of God, apologies. Maybe we need to be filled again and filled anew or filled for the first time this morning and in this year. But today we can be filled with joy because the bridegroom is present with us and will come again to take us with him in to be in that place. So we know our place in the celebration of the bridegroom. We know our place in the celebration that doesn't last just a day or a week, but lasts a lifetime. We're all invited to that table. We're all invited to that party. We all have a place at the table of the bridegroom, the table of our King. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to the table of your Son, Jesus Christ, and as we celebrate his death, his resurrection and his ascension. We thank you that we have a place at that table. Even though we are unworthy, in you we are made new. In you, in turning to you, we are forgiven. And in you we have a place at the celebration of a lifetime. Lord, we thank you for all that you will do in our lives uh, over this next year. Lord, we are expectant of the new of the kingdom, for a renewing and a restoration of things that have gone before. And Lord, if there's anything that we need to leave behind us in 2023, we pray that today we could leave it down at your feet, and lay down our burdens and take up 
your burden, which is easy and is light. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.